and welcome to the Flix Forum podcast, where each episode we go back and we look at a Netflix original film in the order of release. This episode, we have Netflix 250th film from 2020. It's the musical comedy Eurovision Song Contest, the story of Fire and Saga, directed by David Dobkin, stars Will Ferrell, Rachel Adams, Dan Stevens, Muthanthi Mahout, Mikhail Presbrandt, Alfred Dari, Alton, Graham Norton, Demi Lovato, and Pierce Brosnan. I'm Jesse, and for our 250th, Welcome back, MJ. I am. I'm back, Jesse. I yes. I like to pride myself as being a bit of a milestone man. So I came for I came for the fact that it was a big episode. I haven't I haven't done a podcast with you since I had a look at this before. Uncorked. Remember Uncorked? Um, I sure do. That was released at the start of the year. So it's yeah, it's over seven months. So 221 that was. That was number 221. So um, basically 30. You've done 30 pods without me 30 movies without me i've had a quick through look through that list of the 30 that you've done and i don't think i've known or heard of basically oh, there's a couple of them there's a couple of bigger ones in there i think the five bloods is in there and things like that but generally like i don't i don't know what i've missed nothing don't worry <laughs> <laughs> it's been a it's been a, a hard long journey <laughs> You've done very well. You should be you should be very proud of yourself for getting to 250. It's a it's a wonderful achievement. Um, yeah. When you hit me up a while ago and, and said, "Hey, we've got 250. Do you want to come on?" I said, "What movie is it?" And he said, "It's Eurovision Story of Fire Saga." And you know what? This movie was one of those movies that like you I knew I was always going to see. I was going to see this movie at some point in my life. When it came out, it's kind of like ah, uh, you know. Not in a huge rush to see it, but I bet I'll see it. I bet I'll see it. I reckon a lot of people were exactly the same. So this was a great opportunity to actually tick that one off the box. Good. I'm glad. I'm, I'm happy to actually hear someone listen to me rant instead of me just looking at a screen going, <laughs> I hope, <laughs> hope this makes sense. <laughs> let's chat. Let's chat. We don't even have to talk at each other. Let's talk to each other and let's let's take something out of this movie. Good. Well, we're going to say, uh, if you haven't seen this and you want to give us a pause, come back later because we will spoil at various stages. but. We start with the fast flicks. Our quick little summary of what it's all about. What's uh, Eurovision like for you? I, I don't like to use actors' names in fast flicks, but I don't think you can do a fast flicks this movie without mentioning Will Ferrell. And, and like the the elevator pitch for this movie is that Will Ferrell is basically taking on a comedy about people making it to Eurovision against all odds. That's kind of what this movie is. Yeah, it, similar for me. I, I haven't used names, but I've just said a Eurovision fan dreams of being on that stage one day and will stop at nothing together. That's very true. All right. Well, this is where we like to talk a little bit about how it ended up on Netflix. Should I uh, kick this off? Please do, Jesse. I, I feel unprepared. I feel out of whack. And I, 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 I must admit, I haven't even read anything about it. So I'm going to be hearing this for the first time. Good. Some of these things might surprise you. Uh Usually, you know, without someone else here, and there's been a lot of international films recently, so it's nice to actually have a little bit of context that I've, I've got mm. to share today. So we do kick off. This is obviously Will Ferrell. This is his idea, and uh, his interest in Eurovision began because he's got a Swedish wife, and she took him to oh, her he? cousin's house back in 1999, and the family turned the competition on TV, and since then he, he's just kept following it. So um, we jumped to 2014. And he actually travelled to Copenhagen um, in Denmark to watch the finale of the 2014 contest when Ch uh, Conchita won. So he's actually uh, had that experience of being in the crowd and, and following this uh, this contest along, which is an interesting little Excuse thing to my start with. Should I know who Conchita is? Uh, you, I feel like we should. Conchita is one of the big sort of names. Um, that well, one of the only sort of winners that, apart from ABBA, that I sort of know. I think. Um, Maybe so they actually did it. stuff after Eurovision. Well, Conchita's before, in this film as well. During... One of the... Um, when I did that get big that medley. Yeah, when yeah, the medley, yeah, yeah. Um, Conchita's a very famous uh, winner of this show. But okay. I'll, yeah, there we'll keep go. going. So uh, to prep for the film, Carol, he attended the 2018 contest as well in uh, Portugal as a part of the Swedish delegation, which gave him access to follow the show from the start to the finish with the rehearsals and all that sort of stuff. Um, he spoke backstage with the contestants. And then we jumped to 2018 of June and he announced that he was going to star, co-write and produce this film. And Netflix picked it up then. And then we head forward again to uh, March of 2019 where the director, David Dobkin, signed on. Rachel McAdams joined the cast in May. Um, and then McAdams and Ferrell were spotted at the dress rehearsal for the 2019 
Euro song, uh, Eurovision Song Contest in Israel. Um, and then yeah. this stage was then later rebuilt on a soundstage in London. Um, so, you know, a lot of the, the shots from this Tel Aviv version in Israel of the, the audience and the crowd were actually used in the film too, which is, you know, they've done a lot of work to get this up and going. Yeah. Um, jump to 2019 August, Pierce Brosnan jumps on board, Demi Lovato filming in Edinburgh and Glasgow, as well as Iceland. And then um, some further filming was done in England at the Warner Brothers studio, which and this is the second Netflix film that was filmed in that studio after Mowgli, the legend of the jungle oh, yeah. that we covered on the show a while ago. Released. This was meant to be released in May of 2020 on Netflix to coincide with the 2020 Eurovision contest, but COVID hit and that contest was cancelled. Um, so Netflix held onto it and then said a month later, June 26th, cool, we're going to put it out there. Netflix, pretty happy with the, the results, I think. First weekend, top streamed item on Netflix in the USA, reached number one, as well as other regions around the world. Second weekend, bit of a drop though, dropped down to number eight. So a lot of people watched it the first week of release. It came out at the right time, right? Like this is the the midst of lockdowns and nothing, especially cinema lockdowns, nothing's coming out. All of a sudden we've got this brand new Will Ferrell movie. It's straight to yep. your TV at home you're already paying a subscription for. Yeah. Correct. So I guess some interesting sort of facts, I guess after that, that cancellation of the, the actual contest in 2020, the broadcasters around the world who usually have this contest didn't have much to go. So they actually picked up and were able to air this film. Um, a couple of broadcasters, usually the broadcasters oh. that are affiliated with, um, <laughs> with with the content of Eurovision. So here in Australia, SBS, who usually um, plays the, the contest live here, uh, they actually played it on the 14th and 29th of May, the year later in 2021. So this, this film was actually broadcast on Australian linear television. <laughs> was it really? Across yeah. the world, Netflix was like, yep, cool, go for it. Yeah, for, for 2021. So that was, that was pretty good. Um, so the actors, they all put on Icelandic accents for the film. They had dialect coaches. Um, the production in Iceland, um, apparently they spent about $3.5 million, which the Icelandic government actually gave them a million bucks to help cover costs um, as a part of an incentive. So that's cool too. Touch on this before. 13 past Eurovision cont- contestants were in this, this film um, and a lot of other little segments that sort of... Um, play along with that idea of references to the show, like that running hamster wheel. That was a Ukrainian entry from 2014. Um, Rachel McAdams didn't actually sing <laughs> in this in this film. Um, I think that's pretty obvious when you do watch it. There's a Swedish singer. Her name is uh, Molly Sanden, and she was a part oh, of the yeah. junior Eurovision song, uh, song contest in 2006. So, um, yeah, pretty funny, I guess. Instruments, not allowed in Eurovision, um, live instruments anyway. So the the plug-in oh. instrument ideas. And that, that's a part of the, the end of this narrative, I guess, too, because Will Ferrell's character at the end wouldn't be allowed a piano on stage. Oh, yeah. um, so would have been disqualified anyway. How does that work? They have to have pre-recorded music. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Just all about, be, it's all, all about the performance. Um, so, yeah, yeah, mentioned before, released on Netflix, 26th of June, 2020. $35 million production cost altogether. So on the high end for a, for a comedy. Actually, if we look at the, the awards for this one, it had 28 nominations and six wins. So pretty well received um, from, from the awards community. The biggest one, this had an Oscar nominee. This, this was nominated. I saw that. Yeah. Best Achievement in Music for Motion, motion Picture, um, which is crazy. So lots of other awards, um, nominations for Best Compilation Soundtrack at the Grammys as well. Uh, best Song at the Critic Choice Awards. Best Musical at the Hollywood Critics Association, where it won Best Original Song there as well. And then we've also got the Kids' Choice Awards, Will Ferrell, favourite comedy actor, all that sort of stuff. So pretty well received, mm. yeah. I mean, we know 2020 was a slim year for uh, movies coming out. Super so true. obviously there wasn't a heap of competition as there would have been in other years. But you know what? They, you know, there's a lot of original music in this. There's a lot of effort that went into the music in it. So yeah, it holds up. Good. Let's look at the consensus. What are the critics and audiences saying about this film? Yeah, I've got the uh, the IMDb score at 6.5 out of 10 on 99,000 ratings. That number really surprised me, but then obviously the context of it all made so much sense that that many people have watched it. Letterbox 2.7 out of 5, so a lot lower, unsurprisingly lower. But 100, 119,000 people have, have logged it on Letterbox. So no surprise that a lot of eyeballs during this time. Um, as I said, like, regardless of the pandemic, 
Will Ferrell having just an original Netflix film, not even like, even if it was just any streaming service going straight to streaming, people are probably going to check it out. It's such an easy conversion. So, um, but they didn't love it. <laughs> it was all right. Yeah. I mean, and I think the big thing on Letterboxd too, like 119,000 people gave it a rating. And if you looked at how many people had actually logged it as being watched, it goes up to about 174,000. So yeah, that's, that's a lot of people that um, like obviously bored and at stages that that's crazy. And I think, um, you know, we look at Rotten Tomatoes. Critics obviously didn't have much to look at either because there were 182 critics that had had, had reviewed this film. It sits at a 63%, so it's still a little bit fresh. It's on the fresh side. Audience was even higher at 77, and that's on, that was on more than 2,500 ratings, which is super high yeah, on the, right. the Rotten Tomatoes Rotten ratings. Tomatoes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, we, it's the critics, right? Think about the critics on this. <clears throat> They're generally reviewing, you know, there's honestly probably 10 new movies a week that they've got to be doing. And that's probably 20, 20 movies that they're ignoring. In 2020, that number just wasn't there. So whenever there's a new movie, they might as well jump at it, particularly a Will Ferrell right from the Gators movie. Yes. And we've sort of uh, we've been talking about the Metacritic uh, ratings as well recently. And this one is sort of an interesting thing. With Metacritic, they have, it's either like green, yellow, a like traffic light system, green, yellow, red. Yep. Um, and the critics rated out of 100 and the audience is out of 10. So the critics had it in yellow in the middle range on a, 50 and that was on 39 critic reviews which is quite a lot on here the audience was very surprising because it started at 7.7 which is in that green section and that was on 370 reviews so i think if we looked at the rotten tomato audience and the metacritic audience and even imdb audiences kind of like this so how, how walk me through metacritic how how are people contributing to that so metacritic um they take specific only a specific section of crit- the critical the media critics for the critic view and then audience, anyone can jump on and log it on. So similar sort of um, scale with IMDb, I guess. Yeah, cool. That's positive. Yeah. I had a percentage match for this one. Oh, gosh, if I did, I didn't check it. <laughs> I had 82%. <laughs> Netflix is saying I'm going to like this. Netflix, Netflix knows uh, this guy loves Netflix original movies. He's seriously watching a new one every week. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's jump into it. What's your early thoughts on this one? I mean, like, I, I really like Will Ferrell, like, like most people do. I like Rachel McAdams. But <clears throat> like I said to you, I didn't really have any interest in watching this when it came out. But as I said, it's one of those movies that I, I knew I'd see at some point, right? But I, I must admit, I, I did think it was pretty ordinary I, I think that the uh the will ferrell humor it didn't translate like i don't know if it was the accent i don't know if it was the story or his character in general because i could see the humor there i could see like how historically i'd find these things that he's doing or these these idiosyncrasies that he's got or these little unscripted moments that you know pop out i could see that them there and i could see that i'd normally find them funny but it was like they were stuck behind this invisible barrier. And I, I honestly think it is the accent that they've got in my way. Um, I just, so that first hour was just a train wreck for me, just trying to work my way through it and trying to find it funny. Cause I'm like, I, I could see it there, but I didn't find it funny. I think it pulled through all that a little bit. I think it, it relied nicely on some really familiar and comfortable un- the dog tropes and these rom-com vibes to bring out the feels a little bit by the end. So not all was lost, but I, I just couldn't get through and I'm, I'm calling it the accent. I, I just don't think that translated with Will Ferrell's humor. I don't, I, and yeah, I don't know. Is that just a bad performance? Is that just my take on it? I don't know, but it didn't work for me. Uh, this is funny. Cause uh, when I loaded it up to watch, uh, I remembered, oh, I watched the first half hour of this with my wife when it came out. Oh, right. Yeah. Did it say it resume like, playing? Oh. Mm. And I remember why we stopped. This is absolute garbage. <laughs> <laughs> there is not a laugh to be had. This is complete and like, this is horrendous. There is not one redeeming. Well, sorry, that's, that's pretty bad, but there's not much to redeem from this film. It, it's, uh, you know, for such, such talented people, um, Rachel McAdams sort of, is the only thing that sort of holds this film together because without that performance from her, I think this could have been even worse. And do you you find Will Ferrell funny generally? Like you think he's funny? Generally, guy? yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Generally, generally, I mean that I feel like maybe early Will Ferrell was funny, and more recent. There's I can't think of a lot of recent stuff that has actually hit the mark for me. To be honest, he's pretty picky though. He's not not like he's punching out 
heaps and heaps of movies. He's more of a cameo kind of guy now, isn't he? Yeah, and um, this isn't a spoiler or anything. I've seen the, you know, if you, if you think about the the new Barbie movie that's coming out, he's in that, and that's not a spoiler. He's been at the premiere and all that sort of stuff. Yep. You look at that role and you like you just mentioned, it's almost like a cameo role. It's almost like I'll jump in here to to try and get a couple of laughs. And and at times, you know, the Lego movie, you think of these films where he just plays these these over the top characters that are meant to be funny. And I don't know, like I don't know, can he hold a whole film to himself anymore? I don't think he can. Yeah, it's it's an interesting point. And like you think about Anchorman, which is like his crown jewel Ooh, of I love Anchorman. literally floor to floor laughs from start to finish. Like it's it's such a it's such a tough thing to do to, to maintain that level of humor. And that's why Anchorman's so rare. Um yeah. but it, it just it it felt like he was kind of trying to do that with his character and it just did not work. And, and can, can you you see what I was saying where like I can sort of see the Will Ferrell humor there. I could see it, but it wasn't funny. Like I, I knew what he was doing, and I'd like, oh, I guess I would have laughed at that in different contexts, but I just didn't. So maybe um, we're older. I don't know. And that's, that's what it is. We're we're past that age now where that that type of humor would be fun, funny. Maybe, but if I rewatched Anchorman or even like the campaign, the campaign with Zach Galifianakis, like I, I find Will Ferrell really, really a different character, but really, really funny in that. Mm. Um, I don't know. I just. This, this was there, but it didn't work. I guess that's the only way I can put it. Good. Well, let's talk about some characters. Fill us in. Go, I'm glad we agree. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, Lars. Like, as a character, I mean, he's he's the dreamer. He's got this all-consuming dream to go to Eurovision, which is completely blinded by the fact that it's an insane dream. But, hey, that's what you do in these movies, right? You make the impossible possible. So you can live with that. Well, it does feel like he's just this, like, stunted man-child <laughs> who can't get a grasp on reality. But look, he, in the movie, he, he weirdly learns about the love and the selflessness that can help him reach this fulfillment that he's actually reaching for in life as opposed to what he thinks Eurovision is going to deliver for him. And, and whilst he, he comes such a long way from the Lars we see at the start to the Lars we see at the end, but it's kind of a really bizarre and unbelievable journey that gets him there. You know, like All of a sudden, he rolls up at the end and he's done the spoiler alert, obviously, but rolls up at the end for the final song. I mean, he's just like a different person. It's like, yeah, well, what did you really go through to, <laughs> to get to this point? I'm glad you're there, but, you know, I'm not really buying it. And I, I, like, I think part of that unbelievability of that was almost, you know, it, we, you've got this underlying idea that, you know, everyone sees him as a joke, everyone in town pretty much, as well as his father. And even that turn of his father from what you're doing, I hate, to, oh, you're, you're amazing now. Um, it was just like such a quick little thing. It wasn't like a progressive sort of change in mind from his father to believe that, you know, what he was doing was his passion and his dream. It was just like, oh, yeah, cool. So you, you're famous now. You've done a good thing for us. Mm. I like you now. I don't know. I agree. Yeah, exactly. Look, there was kind of like the little one or two people in town that kind of got behind him and then that kind of helped the pack mentality of like, hey, this guy's kind of like doing what he loves and he's putting us on the map to some extent. So I didn't mind that as much, but I mean, it's such a small part of the story. Good. All right. What about Sigrid? Sigrid. Um, firstly, really bothered me the age gap between these two um, and the idea that Rachel McAdams, like the stereotypical girl next door that everyone loves, is so into this Will Ferrell, who is 11 years older than her. <laughs> I just, that, that was already a bit jarring. Um but in a, in a sense, she was she was blinded by, you know, her own, I guess you call it love for Lars, which was weird. But anyway, um, but she she behind all that, she didn't quite understand her own talent. She didn't quite understand any of her own ambition, and, and probably more so than Lars, I, I didn't mind her journey, um, if you want to call it that, because she gets to a place where she does start to stick up for herself. She does start to change her own actions and give herself some more direction. And funnily enough, the the place that she's in at the end of the movie doesn't stray too far away from where she was at the start of the movie. Um, but she gets the things that she wanted that whole time. So obviously she wanted, you know, to be with Lars and she wanted to start a family with him, yeah. which, you know, was never a huge stretch for her to do. And that's where she ends up. So that's kind of nice. But she does have a much more believable journey to get there. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Because I think the the idea that I took away was that she felt like she owed him because she was a mute and through the singing, he taught her how to sing and how to speak and become a human being. But in that same way, like the way he treated her and the, the way he held her back, 
Like surely as a human being, you'd be like, you wouldn't go to, to talk to some elves and be like, you know, he's, he's horrible to me, but I still want to have kids and a family with him. So that was, it was a weird setup. <laughs> yeah. It feels yeah. like we missed so much that happened between these two. Yeah. Could have been a four hour really movie. important to understand, <laughs> to understand this relationship. I'm glad it wasn't, but like, <laughs> the where where we see them at, I'm like I don't really get it, but we have to we have to assume that they've been through so much together to make her feel that way. And his obliviousness to it was just bizarre. Yeah. Uh, any other characters you want to talk about? I just want to talk about Alexander um, quickly because, funnily enough, I actually thought Dan Stevens was great in this. I thought he played this role really well, and and maybe it's me having a little bit less familiarity with him than obviously Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams that makes me take that leap with him. But I don't really think so. I think he just nailed this character. And I thought it was really, he was quite funny. Um, but what I like about the character is that he wasn't a full villain. Like, like you know, he's kind of standing in the way of the Lars Sigrid happy ending. But despite being a little bit selfish and deceptive, and he's obviously got his own things going on on the side, he's generally a good guy and he doesn't have this villain's crash landing by the end of it. And I kind of like that move that you didn't really need anything bad. You just kind of needed something to appear that maybe it wasn't going to be all rosy for the two leads um, without actually having to burn and trash another character in the meantime. So I thought that was done quite well. Uh, Yeah. I think it was done quite well too in the fact that Lars felt really threatened by him, but he didn't really need to. So it sort of showed some more insecurities um, to do with Lars as well. And then who he was as a person, because you know, they, they make it quite clear that he's probably not into the female gender. And mm. I'm not sure that it was a, a good in, insight into Sigrid in that she probably couldn't, you know, maybe she's just so oblivious to everything that she couldn't work that out. But it sort of did show us more about Lars and uh, his his insecurities too. But, yeah, good performance. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I just found all of the songs, and but this is probably more, more later on, but, yes, great performer. I don't know that all these songs and dance and stuff, were needed as I know it's a Eurovision song contest, but they were some of the the things that sort of whenever he sang or I saw him on stage, I was like, ah, oh, this character's really annoying me again. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other character? Yeah. No, there's no, there's no others that no. that deemed too much. Um, just the I just had that Victor uh, Carlos and that governor dude from the the Iceland, the Central Bank of Iceland. Um, he's the guy that doesn't want Euro. Um, Bad guy, Iceland yeah. to win, yeah, Eurovision, the bad guy. Um, I just thought a lot of his pieces of him being the person that's trying to kill them off at times. I don't know. I just thought it was really disjointed as a character. Um, and I feel like if you're <laughs> going to make it so obvious someone's the villain, then just be clear with what they're doing. Don't try and make it out like it's a it's a, a decoy for the audience. I, I'm not sure that's that's more of not the performance, but the the character. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, I, I think that's about it. Nothing else to say. I did find it weird that um, it really Eric, feel like a weird decoy. Yeah, yeah. I did find it weird that Eric um, Lars's dad ended up with Secret's mum in the end. I thought that wasn't needed either. Really weird. Yeah, that's like that Will Ferrell humor, right? Coming into play yeah. from a story perspective. Like oh, this is yeah. crazy, but like, hey, crazy is what we do. Yeah. All right, director Dave Dobkin. Uh, <laughs> pretty interesting uh, bio. Like the music videos for like Pupac, Coolio, Maroon Five, Elton John. Did Shanghai Nights with Jack Chan and Owen Wilson, Fred Claude, The Change Up, The Judge, Wedding Crashes, and The Wedding Crashes sequel. Just a mixed bag. Absolute mixed bag. The Judge does not fit in no. everything that you just said. No. Yeah. Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> yeah, I'm not like, just, but, but you can go like, you got three pack music video clips and Coolio, and then you jump to Maroon 5, then you jump to Elton John, and you jump to like action with Jackie Chan, and then you're doing drama yeah. as The Judge, and then you're doing Wedding Crashes. Like, it's a huge huge uh difference in a lot of genre style jumping yeah some good movies in there though yeah uh scenes what are some scenes that uh you liked in this one if there are any i got three and i don't know this might go against what you were saying about the songs but i i liked that song at the party which is as you said i think they were all a lot of previous like winners or performers of eurovision there i I actually picked up on that i reckon about three quarters of the way through i'm like oh these must actually you know what the bearded the bearded lady that's she, I, that, she's up. Eurovision. That's what that's what made me. Ah, oh, is it really? Yeah. Uh, that's what made me click. I'm like, oh, I think she's from Eurovision. So I'm like, oh, they must all be from Eurovision. But I thought that was really good. I thought that had a um, those really nice pitch perfect vibes when they do those yep. like uh, song mashups. You know, so I thought, that was really good. I enjoyed that. It's the first part of the movie that I was, that I was enjoying. 
this is the only bit of humor that hit for me. And even then when I say it hit, it was just like a chuckle every time. But I enjoyed the recurring joke of, are you brother and sister? And <laughs> Lars always responded with, probably not. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just thought probably not is such a funny response to that. Like, it's such a definitive question. Um, and and I like the final song. The final song that they sung for it, um, they they definitely got that right with the with the feels. Yeah, I'll agree. The the final performance from Secret that was one of the things I thought was okay. The only other thing that I kind of thought was okay, I don't, I didn't find the the stuffing of um, of his pants to make his penis look bigger funny. But when he was going through the crowd and hitting people's faces, I thought that was uh, that was humorous. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it is real. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's true. Um, what are some things that you didn't like on this? I've got nothing specific from the first hour because I thought that I was going to sit there and say the whole movie was trash. Yep. So I just didn't bother. Um, then when I thought I oh, maybe we're going somewhere with this, it really derailed that that scene where Lars was telling everyone that he wants to have sex with them. That was again maybe that's maybe the Will Ferrell humor that normally works elsewhere. It did not work one bit. Thought it was ridiculous. And look. Like, the main thing I don't like, and you touched on this when you were talking about that exec, um, that whole story, you're right, didn't work, didn't fit. It was this weird decoy thing, even when they kept having flashbacks from that singer who kept trying to tell them that he was the bad guy. And then at the end, he's, like, he's the bad guy. And he's like, yeah, I know already killed him. When they killed him off, that scene was ridiculous. <laughs> that was <laughs> so <laughs> insane. That, and then, but the whole storyline added nothing to this movie. So... Um, could have gone without this movie was a was a pretty big two hours it could have yeah. gone without anything of that and we wouldn't have changed it at all so um yeah they got that very very wrong all right um a couple of couple of little things that we sort of agree disagree on i guess in parts and so for me the first like you mentioned the start rubbish but there's a moment where um lars and and sigrid they're sitting on this bench and she wants a kiss and he's like i want to focus on music and then he does that fake phone call thing um you know it's the mayor of winning <laughs> He wants to say something to you. I was like, ah, oh, this just this is something that Will Ferrell, maybe in an American accent in America, might work. It just didn't like I think probably You're right. really talking about the accent and, and the locations. Um I didn't like the whole idea of Lars and Secret being a brother and sister. I didn't find it funny because I think it was used too much. I think if you make that joke yeah. maybe once or twice, I feel like it was used like it was a beat like multiple times that just overused. Um the breakaway song at the party that you like. Yeah, you know, the, oh, no. I believe in love. Nah, the Black Eyed Peas. I got a feeling. I did not like it at all. I just thought it, it completely took away from some of the moments they were trying to draw upon. Like I was more interested in where where were each character going to go? How you know was where was where Sigrid going to go? Was Lars going to realize what's going on? I was more into that than this big breakout song. Oh, I was took away from. See, it I wasn't into that at all. So the, the, break, <laughs> the breakout song was a nice relief. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you mentioned too that um, that that moment where Lars and Secret having that argument, and then talked about sleeping with everyone in the studio. Agree, complete rubbish. Graham Norton, love the guy. Talk mm. show host, UK talk show host. He does the commentary in the UK for Eurovision. I understand why he's there. It felt like he was like in a box on Mars doing this commentary <laughs> from a thousand million miles away. It just felt so out of place and not connected. I just that was such poor production in in his segments. Um, yeah, and true. the Americans just, just the Americans and the idea oh, yeah, of God. everything to do with oh. them, their, their race across the city, especially to get Lars to Eurovision was pointless. Definitely. And then to have them back at the end and the earlier moment at that, that moment I mentioned before where they're sitting by that <laughs> fountain, I think like, it's just yeah, not yeah. needed. Um, yeah, that's right. They're at the end as well. Yeah. <laughs> <I forgot about. laughs> uh, themes, ideas. What's it trying to say? Um, I should say. Before I watched this movie, because we tried the brother and sister thing, two things. I thought it was based on a true story, just assumed it was. Um, <laughs> and then when it started, and I don't, I didn't want to check this during the movie because I didn't want to see a spoiler. But I just, I realized pretty quickly it probably wasn't. And secondly, I assumed it was based on a true story about a brother and sister that were uh, that were in a band and they somehow won year of it. That's that's what I thought it was the whole time. Um, You've been heavily disappointed. I would have it was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um so themes um look obviously the kind of crux of this movie is around faith and dreams and i think they do this really explicitly with the 
the elves or the fairies, whichever they were. That's like that kind of blind faith in in something. But then also the fact that like this this whole thing is prefaced by Lars's dream to make it to Eurovision, as ridiculous as it is. So the idea of following your dreams and trying to get there is is kind of applauded to some extent. Um, and then the, then also being who you are, no matter what others think, and and celebrating that. Don't just be who you are and and try and hide in the shadows. Be who you are and be as big as proud as you want. And if you don't celebrate that, then nobody else will. So um, th- th- those are really nice things to to preface a movie around. Hmm. I agree. Yeah. The, that whole idea of not giving up on your dreams, not quitting, you know, the lengths you'll go to for success to, to win. Um, you know, sometimes you're going to hurt people on the way too, but you've got to learn from those mistakes. Uh, there's this website called Kids in Mind, and this is a list of all the themes that they listed off that were in this film. So you've got European cultures, beliefs, global dislike of Americans, singing contests, rivalries, <sighs> money and power, winning and losing, determination, respect, acceptance, families, fathers and sons, love, relationships and pansexualism there we go sure the global hedge of america is funny <laughs> <laughs> i thought that's funny so i included it <laughs> what did you take away from this one yeah look this was a this was a big swing and it was a pretty big miss um i i think it it's definitely good that it landed where it landed in terms of being a streaming product um and Look, we know that when big stars appear on Netflix originals or, or streaming, you know, direct to streaming anyway, it's going to get eyeballs. As I said, you're already paying for a subscription. The idea of seeing a Will Ferrell movie for, on a service that you're already paying for is a pretty easy conversion. So if this movie goes to the big screen, it dies a very, very quick death. Similarly with what you said, it was the number one Netflix movie the weekend it came out and then it drops to number eight the next week. People saw it and was like, oh, I don't know if you need to watch this one. But um, it's hard enough for comedies to make their mark in cinemas these days uh, and this certainly would not have been bucking that trend yep only thing i learned i uh, take away from this film is i learned that rachel mcadams is canadian that was my take out with the, the credits and they had the flags with each of the actors didn't know she was canadian that's right that was a nice touch i, I feel like i knew that but maybe not I don't know. yeah <laughs> that's here. all you took out of the film yep <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to take something right correct i just struggled for that one uh, did you jump on imdb check anyone out yeah, I did. I'm going to have to really carefully read his name. Ulifer Dari Olofsson. So he played Neil, the Icelandic government, kind of like Eurovision exec, not the bad guy, the main oh, guy. Yeah. He's in heaps of stuff. He's got a very familiar face. Um, he's in stuff that I've seen, like The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, Crimes of Grindelwald. I think I remember him from, from Murder Mystery, the obviously Netflix original film. Um, Adam Stanley, Jennifer Aniston film, but he's just got that face that, you know, probably the beard. Um, there you go. So I was very satisfied when I saw that. I'm like, oh, I've seen like 10 things he's in. Good. No, I didn't, uh, didn't get on at all. And I don't have any questions for you. Did you have any questions for me? Well, I did have a question around the accents and whether you had an issue with them, but we, I feel like we kind of covered that, but I yeah. guess you didn't explicitly say, did you have an issue with Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams' accent? And I guess yeah, it's, I, it's tricky. I mean, you, you're playing Icelandic competitors so you got to have something so i think that's the the trick is um yeah it's, uh, yeah it's, it's hard isn't it unless you make a completely false story and have americans in the competition for, for sure. the first time that had never been in there then maybe you did change it up but you've got to do some sort of or you hire icelandic actors Icelandic actors, <laughs> but then you don't have the big names <laughs> to draw people in no i know i know <laughs> um are you are you a eurovision fan at all um no i'm like Seeing bits and pieces, especially when we had Australian contestants in there at stages. So when like Guy Sebastian was on there, I, I tuned in and, and things like that. Are we not still? I thought we still Yeah, we do. still do. Yeah, we still do. Yeah, they're just yeah. not as big names. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. Not yeah. Maybe I'm just not in the popular culture uh, context anymore, but yeah. Oh, you know, I'm not. But how do you, how do you qualify? Like who chooses this stuff? So it has to, there's like rules to it. I, don't quote me on it, but they've got to have... Mm. Uh, an actual competition in Australia to determine who the representative is. So they usually do it on the Gold Coast. I think that it's like 10 people are put up, they all sing. And then I think they, they air it on SBS and then the Australian public has to vote. I think, oh, cool. or, okay. or, some, or, or the industry votes on, or the country votes on who goes through. I think yeah, that's how cool. it works. That's, yeah. that's pretty cool. It's a nice idea. Yeah. All right. I think we're ready to wrap it up. I think we're, we're ready well, to yeah. come up with a rating out of five. Give us an average. Finish off with your, your final thoughts. Yeah, it's uh, as I said, it's a swing and a miss. This is a big, big idea. It could have gone either way. I think it went the wrong way. Um, 
but it still made you feel a little bit for the characters. Um, all in all, though, it was a pretty tough watch, and I would not be able to recommend it to anybody, to be honest. I think it'd be a hard sell. So I, I did still sneak it up to two stars, though. It still snuck two stars, which is generous. Nice. It feels generous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, not an inch of me that wants to revisit any part of this film ever again. Didn't find it humorous, let alone funny. It dragged like that. You mentioned it before. That, that runtime really brings it down. Uh, yeah. I think the biggest thing is I'm super disappointed this is our 250th episode. Uh, it would have been nice to have <laughs> a, a good good film. Uh, I'm giving it one and a half, which gives us a 1.75 out of five. That's so pretty good. low from us. Pretty low. Uh, I actually have to say, I watched this across two nights. <laughs> this yeah. is probably a more sign of my life right now with a newborn. But um, yeah, I, I did this in, in like hour, hour stints. <laughs> Turn it into a mini series. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've got socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Question. And you've already asked this question anyway, but have you ever watched Eurovision? Um, I have, yes. <laughs> I don't think I does it, it. I don't think I'd hate it, but I feel like it just. I just don't know about it enough. Maybe, I feel, maybe when Guy, Guy Sebastian was on, I feel like it got a fair bit of buzz, but I I couldn't even tell you when it's on. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it is. It's a big European thing. I've got an Italian friend, obviously, like my age, who. They, like they have family gatherings to sit around the TV and watch it and stuff like that. So love that. Um, yeah, it's like the grand so, final. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, good. All right. Well, next week back for an international film. It's an Italian comedy drama from 2020 called Under the Racconi Sun, or in Italian, it's Soto il Solo di Racconi. It's directed by You Nuts with an exclamation mark at the end. So one word: Y O U, capital N U T S. You Nuts. Stars Cristiano Ricamo, <laughs> Ludovico Martino, Lorenzo Zuzolo, and Isabella Ferrari. That's what we've got. Um, I'm sure you're not here next week, so enjoy the week off. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, as much as I do enjoy you nuts' work, um, <laughs> I might give that one a miss. If you have a chance to choose a stage name, let's not pretend that's his real name or her real name, sorry. Um, if you have a chance to choose it, that's, that's an absurd choice of a name. Horrendous. And I hope you go into depth on it next week. Oh, I'm sh- uh, I'll explain what the, the, I'm sure I'll explain what you nuts uh, means. <laughs> okay, good. It's been great. I've enjoyed this. So it feels a bit of normality back to life. So thanks for being here. You're welcome, mate. I'm going to have to do a bit of picking and choosing on that, on that list of movies to see what works for me. Sounds good. I, I would love to have you back soon. So um, as always, see you. hopefully I'll see you soon. Thanks, mate. Good to be here. Good to be back. <laughs>